since you just completed the intro lab, hopefully you're more familiar with these chemicals that we're utilizing in this experiment. We're using a substrate, which is called catechol, and it's colorless. And we added an enzyme to it, and that enzyme is polyphenol oxidase, which is abbreviated PPO there. And we ended up with a product, and that product is a quinone, and that's eventually converted to a brown molecule. And so that's why we saw the browning in the cuvette after we added the enzyme. So let's indicate that in that cuvette, we added the catechol, we added five drops of the enzyme, and then over time we saw this happen. You should be able to relate this reaction to a lock and key model or an induced bit model of an enzyme. So catechol is the substrate, binds to the active site of polyphenol oxidase, which converts it into a quinone. And that's the product. Now, a little bit of background of polyphenol oxidase. I indicated that I isolated it from potatoes. When we have a plant cell, which has that really large vacuole in it, that vacuole can store molecules. And one thing that it stores is polyphenol oxidase. Now, whenever this cell is damaged in some way, so let's say something happens and it tears the membrane of the cell, then the polyphenol oxidase is able to come out of the where it can bind to the substrate and start to form these quinones. Whenever these quinones start to form in that area, then you see the browning of that piece of fruit. This reaction is actually beneficial to a plant because these quinones that are going to form in that area are antibacterial. So if there's bacteria that gets into the fruit at that location, then the plants are forming a molecule that is actually able to um, inhibit the growth of bacteria. So that's the benefit to having polyphenol oxidase and allowing this reaction to take place whenever there's damage to plant tissues. This also explains why we can take some quinones and we utilize them to make pesticides. If plant tissue is being damaged by a chewing insect, then those polyphenol oxidase enzymes are going to be released from those damaged cells. They're going to make those quinones, and those quinones have a bad taste to those chewing insects. So they're less likely to eat on that plant. If we spray molecules that are derivatives of quinones, then we're basically applying chemical to a plant that is not tasty to these chewing insects. So we're going to get less insect damage to our crops. From the intro lab, you have learned that we're going to measure reaction rate. And we can measure reaction rate in two different ways. We can either measure the appearance of a product over time, or we can measure the disappearance of a reactant over time. Well, in this case, since the quinone's brown, we're going to measure the change in product or the change in the quinone concentration over time and since quinones are brown in color, then basically what we're measuring is the change in color or the darkness of the solution over time. If we had a way to actually measure the disappearance of the catechol here, then we could actually calculate rate by the change in reactant concentration over time, but we really don't have a way to measure the catechol concentration. Using the computers and the calorimeters last class left you with graphs that looked similar to this one here. And we saw a line increasing and then eventually leveling out over time. And I think you understood that what this line was doing is it was recording the change in the color over time or it was recording the production of the quinones over time. So this line is showing us the change in product concentration over time. But we need to make sure that you thoroughly understand the shape of this line in the graph. You can explain why this line has its shape and why the slope of the line is changing over time until eventually we get a slope of zero. And eventually you're going to have to explain the slope of this line as well. And we're going to get to what this line means in just a second.
the reason why I'm spending so much time to talk about this graph that's showing a change in concentration over a change in time is because next class I'm going to show you four different graphs and they're not going to have concentration over time. They're going to have reaction rate and they're going to have a variable on that x-axis. And students get these two types of graphs mixed up. So we want to make sure that you understand this one really well. So whenever I go over the other four graphs next class, you're not going to confuse what they're trying to tell you. So first, let's look at what that product line is telling us. And we see at the very beginning of the reaction, we have a slope like that. And as the reaction is taking place, we see that the slope of this line is decreasing over time. So initially, the slope is high. We have a very high slope. So slope is an indication of reaction rate. So if we have a line that is more sloped than another, then that means that the more sloped line is indicating there was a higher reaction rate. So the reaction rate is high initially when we first put those cuvettes into the colorimeters. Over time, the slope is decreasing, and you have to be able to explain why that is occurring. We only put so much catechol, remember catechol is a substrate, into the cuvette. I believe it was 1.5 milliliters. Polyphenol oxidase is going to take that catechol and it's going to convert it into the quinone. And it's going to continue to do that until we're basically out of catechol. So over time, that slope decreases because catechol, or the substrate concentration, is decreasing. Now, past 500 seconds, which is about over there, we can see that we have a flat line. Slope is zero. So if slope is zero, that means reaction rate is zero. And we want to make sure you understand what it means whenever the reaction rate is zero. That means that the reaction has stopped. The reaction has stopped because there is no more substrate. There is a question on the intro lab that asks you why the line levels off and slope becomes zero. And a lot of you are talking about the enzyme. The enzyme that we put into this cuvette is the exact same amount of enzyme that is there at the end of this reaction. Remember, the enzymes are not used up in this reaction. So that means that there was 100 enzymes in those five drops of polyphenol oxidase. Then at the end of this reaction, when the reaction is over, there's still going to be 100 of those enzymes in that cuvette. Now, sometimes you're going to get the change in product over time. And again, that's what this line is indicating. So you have to know to calculate the rate of this reaction in this cuvette, then you want to put two dots there before the slope of the line changes. And you want to calculate the slope of this line. And remember, the slope is the change in y. So if we start at 0, then from here to here, that's our change in y. And then if we start at zero and we stop at this time, that's going to be our change in x. And rate is the change in y divided by the change in x. So let's look at this other line. I'm showing you the change in reactant concentration over time. So I'm showing you the change in catechol, basically, for this reaction. And we can see that catechol is disappearing over time, or it's becoming less concentrated. That's because polyphenol oxidase is turning it into those quinones. Whatever the rate is here, if we calculate the slope of this line, it's going to show us the exact same rate. Because we should be getting the same rate of product formation as we are of the reactant disappearing. So we see that eventually the reactant drops down to zero. And so we have a flat line there, which indicates the slope is zero, the reaction rate is zero, because we're out of substrate. Down here in this box, I kind of explain what that reactant line is telling us. So if I show you a graph like this, and you see that there's changing concentration on the y-axis, there's changing time on the x-axis, then you should be able to tell me what I'm measuring to calculate rate. Am I measuring the appearance of a product or the disappearance of a reactant? And so since we see concentration is dropping, we are showing you the change in concentration of the reactant over time. So the graph is showing you reactant concentration over time.
And again, I indicated that we want to calculate this initial rate. I want to make sure you understand why we're going to calculate the initial rate and not this average rate over time. And let me get rid of that second line here. We want the highest reaction rate that's possible. And that highest reaction rate is going to occur when there's plenty of substrate. As the reaction progresses, we know rate is going to change because substrate concentration is changing as well. So when we calculate the rate of a reaction, we always want to do the initial reaction rate before the loss of substrate becomes a factor. Now one thing I want to point out, because you might see this in one of your college classes whenever you're trying to calculate rate, there's lots of different rates that's being shown on this graph. Because remember, rate is the slope of the line. So if I want to know what the rate is at this time right here, to calculate rate, what you really do is you draw a line that is tangent to this curved line. And then you can calculate rate by this change in y over this change in x. That would give me the exact rate at this point in time. If I want to calculate the rate later on in time when the reaction is slow due to lack of substrates, let's say I want to calculate the rate right here at this time, then I will go to the curve, I draw a straight line that is tangent to that curved line, and then I can calculate, there's my change in y over my change in x. So I'm not going to have you do that on your worksheets or on your quiz or your test. Basically, I need you to understand that if you're going to calculate reaction rate and you're given data that's like this, you need to calculate the slope of the line initially before this line starts to curve because that indicates reaction rate is starting to slow down. Now, I've indicated in this box another great AP type question. So it says, add a line to show the concentration of the enzyme over time. And I just talked about that as enzymes are catalyzing reactions, the enzymes are not themselves used up. So if the concentration of the enzyme was right here initially, then as the reaction takes place, at the end of the reaction, I still should have just as much enzyme in that cuvette. On this page, I want to talk a little bit about the experiments that you're doing next class. So again, here's the reaction that we're going to utilize. We have catechol, which is clear. We're going to add some polyphenol oxidase, and that's going to form those quinones. To measure the change in color over time, we're using the colorimeters. You were asked to read the lab so that you understood the variables that we are going to change and test next class. So we're going to have a control, and your control is just going to give us a reaction rate that we can compare these others to whenever we change variables in these other cuvettes. So we're going to have a certain amount of catechol. We're going to add the five drops of enzymes. We're going to calculate an initial reaction rate, and then we can use that to compare to the rates of the other reactions happening in the other cuvettes. So here's some things that we're going to do in the other cuvettes. We're going to change the substrate concentration. We're going to increase it, and we're going to decrease it. We've already done a little bit with lemon juice, and what happens if we decrease the pH? We're going to decrease and increase the enzyme itself, polyphenol oxidase, and then we're going to add a competitive inhibitor. So I have a couple other molecules that have a similar shape to catechol, and we're going to see if they are going to inhibit this reaction, They're going to inhibit the formation of this brown product. So let's indicate these competitive inhibitors are molecules that have a shape similar to catechol. And you're probably already thinking that if they have a shape that's similar to catechol, then if they're going to inhibit that enzyme, they're probably going to do it competitively because they can bind to the active site and prevent catechol from binding. This picture should look familiar to you. This is a screenshot of the laptop, and you can see our Logger Pro program that we're using to collect data for us. I want to emphasize that there's a need for speed whenever you're doing this lab because you're going to mix your catechol, your substrate, with some water, and the reaction is not going to take place until you add that enzyme. And so once you add that enzyme, you have to be very quick. So you're going to do your five drops of enzyme, you're going to cap the cuvette, you're going to invert it once, and you're quickly going to put it in the colorimeter. 
And as soon as that lid is closed on the calorimeter, you need to hit the green triangle button, the start button. But be careful because you might be asked another question after that. Do you want to save your data or discard it? You want to click that very first one that you want to save that data set. Just be ready to do that. So you can click the green triangle button and you can quickly click to save that previous data set. Time is of the essence because as soon as you add that enzyme, that reaction is taking place and we need to calculate the initial reaction rate before we start to run out of catechol. Here's some sample data from a lab group. I want to indicate that this button right here is awfully handy. If you click on that, it gives you this line and it basically tells you, you can move this line back and forth and it'll tell you what these values are. This box pops up here and it also highlights it right here for you. And it, what this is telling you is that at this dot, it is 15 seconds into your experiment. It says that right here. And it's also telling you that the absorbance at that time is 57%. So if you have two data points and you have a line connecting the two that is fairly straight, you can calculate the slope of the line and that's going to give you your initial reaction rate. So you basically are finding the difference in absorbance. So here's the absorbance at the beginning, and here's the absorbance about 15 seconds in. And here is our change in time. So when we go to calculate rate, our change in absorbance, and absorbance is being measured as percent, that change is 9%. Don't forget your units, and the change in time is 15 seconds. Now, I want to point out something real quick. Most of our computers were using seconds for time, but there was one computer that was indicating that time was in minutes, and it was giving you 0.1 minute, 0.2 minute, 0.3 minute, and so on. So whatever your computer is using for time, just make sure that the units on your computer match the units that you see in these problems. So once you plug that into your calculator, you're going to get your rate, and that's always going to be in percent over seconds, since those are the units that we have on the top and the bottom. And I might be beating a dead horse here, but I want to make sure you understand what this calorimeter is doing. Whenever we mix the substrate and the polyphenol oxidase, you're going to see this. Now, you're not actually going to see it because these cuvettes are placed in the colorimeter. But we start off with clear, and then we see uh, the browning of the solution. In this lab, we have set our colorimeters to measure the percent absorbance. And I want to make sure you understand what we mean by percent absorbance. So what this machine is doing is it has a light, and it's shining a light through those cuvettes, and basically, it's measuring how much light is making it through the solution in the cuvette to the other side. And if we ask the machine to report percent absorbance, it's determining how much light is being absorbed by the solution. And I think you understand that the darker the solution, the more product and we're going to have a higher absorbance. So when we look at these three cuvettes here, and you can see that this cuvette is darkening over time. At this time, you can see that most of the light is passing through. Very little is being absorbed. So you might have something like a 1% absorbance here. Whenever the solution darkens up a little bit more, then we're up to a higher number. So it'd be like 43%. And then if you look at this last cubet here, then we're going to see that this solution is absorbing most of the light. Very little is making it through to the other side. So we're going to see something like 80% absorbance. Now, if I give you problems and I show you information that's like this, you should be able to answer questions about this lab and about this diagram. So, for example, you should be able to tell me which cuvette contains the most catechol in it. And hopefully you think that it's this first one right here, catechol was clear, and the reaction obviously hasn't started because we're not seeing any quinones forming, or we do not have any browning of that solution. I could ask you which of these cuvettes has a greater concentration of product, so you should be able to tell me it's the third one. If I ask you how is the enzyme concentration changing over time, 
in these cuvettes, then you should be able to answer that enzyme concentration is staying exactly the same because enzymes are not consumed in these reactions. I could also give you questions like this. This is a cuvette after five minutes. This is a cuvette after five minutes. And this is a cuvette after five minutes. On the following graph that shows the change in product concentration over time, draw three lines to indicate the reaction rates that are taking place in each of these cuvettes. So since we see that we haven't really gotten any product form, then we should be drawing a line straight like that. In this one, we have browning of the solution, but not as much as for this one over here. So this one, the reaction is taking place at a lower rate, so we should see something more like this. Whereas in this solution, it happened at a greater rate because at five minutes is a darker color, and so there's a greater rate if we have a greater slope of the line. So we would see something that looks like this. And after we complete the lab next class, then you should be able to correctly draw these graphs showing how a change in a variable would affect rate. So it says, can you predict how a change in factors affects reaction rate and explain the results? So here we have the control. We have catechol and polyphenol oxidase in a cuvette. And so let's say our reaction rate is something that's like this. And again, you should be able to explain why the line levels off after a certain period of time. The next part says add twice as much polyphenol oxidase. We will get a higher reaction rate. So we should see something like this. Compared to the control, we should see a higher initial rate and then eventually the leveling off of the line. You should be able to explain that the reason why we have a higher initial rate of reaction is because there's more enzymes to catalyze the reaction. So we're going to get the product formed at a greater rate. If we were looking at the cuvettes instead of having them in the colorimeters, then we would probably see something like this. If in this reaction we really didn't see much browning until minute five, then we're probably going to see browning a lot sooner in minute two. The next part says cut the amount of catechol in half. So we are lowering the substrate concentration. So that should lower the reaction rate because it's going to take longer for these catechol molecules to combine with these enzymes. So we should have a lower rate than the control. So again, the slope should look more like that until it eventually levels off. So if the control was browning up at five minutes and the reaction is taking longer in this situation, then we should probably add another cuvette and that's when we're going to see more browning compared to the control. The next question says we boiled polyphenol oxidase before we added it, so that means that we're going to denature the enzyme. If we have a denatured enzyme, then no reaction is going to take place, no product is going to be formed, and we're not going to see any browning of the solution. So if reaction rate is zero, then we're going to have a line with a slope of zero. Now, I'm not going to really get into this page because we're going to start this page in the next lecture, but I want to show you what I was warning you about. I'm going to show you some more rate curves, and you have to be able to understand the shape of these curves on these graphs. And these graphs are showing you something completely different than what this is showing you up here because now we have something different on that x-axis. We have reaction rate, and then we have a variable that we can manipulate or change such as pH or temperature. Now, eventually, you're going to pick one of these four variables. So you can alter pH or you could change temperature, substrate concentration or enzyme concentration. You're going to have to calculate the reaction rate of these vials where you're going to alter something like the substrate concentration of each of those. And then you're going to see a curve um, like we're going to indicate on these graphs here. So again, make sure you understand this graph and what it's telling you so that when we get down here to these graphs, you can also explain what they're indicating because they're going to indicate something different.